Good evening. Uh, my name is Anwar Majid, and uh, I'm the director of the Center for Global Humanities. And welcome to uh, this event. Uh, we are very delighted to host today a great scholar and uh, whose books are absolutely fascinating and which I highly recommend. Uh, it's um, Carl Richard. We'll be talking about the um, Greeks and Romans bearing gifts, how the ancients inspired the founding fathers. Uh, Carl uh, J. Richard, or Richard, I should say, because he's of French descent, received his PhD in history from Vanderbilt University in 1988. His books include the, Founda the Founders and the Classics, Greece, Rome, and the American Enlightenment, which was published by Harvard University Press in 94. Uh, 12 Greeks and Romans Who Changed the World, published in 2003 by Roman and Littlefield. The Battle for the American Mind, A Brief History of a Nation's Thought, published in 2004. Greeks and Romans Bearing Gifts, How the Ancients Inspired the Founding Fathers, uh, uh, published in 2008. The Golden Age of the Classics in America, Greece, Rome, and the Antebellum United States, published by Harvard in 2009. And Why We Are All Romans, the Roman Contribution to the Western World, published in 2010. He is currently finishing a book on the, founders, uh, the Founding Fathers on the Bible. So we have a lot to learn from him regarding this very interesting topic, particularly uh, as certain parts of the globe are trying to negotiate uh, writing constitutions and establishing nations based on uh, justice and fairness. So help me welcome Professor Richard. Thank you. Uh, today I'm going to talk about stories. People love stories, and I think stories are very important. Our stories are not the founding fathers' story, stories, and ironically, the founders themselves are partly responsible for this fact. In their successful quest to match the deeds of the ancients, their own heroes, whom they first encountered in the tales of ancient historians while still children, the founders became our heroes, the source of so many of our own national stories. Thus the founders drove the ancients from their pedestals and occupied their places. While Washington spoke of Cincinnatus and the plow, we speak of Washington and the cherry tree. But however understandable the modern public's lack of familiarity with some of the tales of Greece and Rome, it is an unfortunate situation for in neglecting these stories, we neglect an important part of our own heritage. After all, these were the tales that inspired the founders to rebel against the mother country and to establish a republic they hoped would one day rival those of Greece and Rome. No one possesses more influence than a master storyteller. The love of stories seems to be an innate human trait present in all cultures. Every teacher knows that students are far more apt to remember a story than to remember any other information. Uh, in fact, I remember once I was talking about Martin Luther, and I told the story about how he was struck by a bolt of lightning, and he said, I'll become a monk, you know, if, if you spare me, God. And then I, and, and I, I passed over this very briefly, and then I talked for 20 minutes about his doctrines and how they differed from the Catholic doctrines and so on. And we were having a review for the exam, and uh, a student raised her hand, and she said, if we get Martin Luther on the exam, what should we write? She said, all I have in my notes is that he was struck by a bolt of lightning. So on, on, in her mind, he was the equivalent to Lee Trevino or, or some uh, park ranger or something. Uh, but it shows, I mean, they remember the stories, but not, uh, you know, we remember stories more than anything else. And the better the tale and the more vividly it is told, the more humans want to believe it, and the more apt they are to internalize whatever lesson it imparts. And most stories do impart a lesson, however subtly, just by their very structure. Uh, and most readers and listeners are not pleased with tales they feel have not imparted one, considering such stories a waste of their time. If you think about the, uh, we all know at least one person who tells these long stories and they don't seem to have any point. To them, we get very exasperated with that story. We want, we want some, we call it a point, but it's really a lesson. Uh, 
For this reason, it has been said that those who control a society's stories control the society. The Founding Fathers' favorite storytellers were the historians of Greece and Rome. From these master storytellers, the Founders learned valuable lessons, personal, social, and political, that influenced both the birth and the course of the United States. The Founding Fathers encountered most of these ancient historians at an early and impressionable age in grammar school and at college. In fact, the grammar in grammar school referred to Greek and Latin grammar, not English grammar. The mother tongue was not taught in American schools until after the Revolutionary War, since most 18th century Americans believed that precious school time should be reserved for serious academic subjects like the classical languages, not wasted on knowledge the child could learn at home. They said, your mama teaches you English, you come to school to learn serious things, Greek and Latin. The founders' training in, in the classical languages frequently began around age eight or so, whether under the direction of public grammar school masters or private tutors. Teachers concentrated on the works from which candidates for college admission were expected to recite, a list that changed little throughout the 17th and 18th centuries. Such works including the, included the writings of Cicero, Virgil, and Homer, and the Greek New Testament. Only the poorest areas lacked grammar schools. The better teachers, such as James Madison's instructor, Donald Robertson, went beyond the short list of classical authors. Robertson instructed his students in the works of Herodotus, Thucydides, Plato, Julius Caesar, Tacitus, and many others. Madison's early training was so thorough that although he arrived at the College of New Jersey, which is now Princeton, in 1769, only two weeks before final examinations, he passed them all. Madison later testified regarding Robertson, quote, all that I have been in life I owe to that man. The college curricula were as standardized and classically based as the grammar school curricula and the college uh, entrance exams. Colleges typically required at least three more years of Greek and Latin. Schoolmates of Thomas Jefferson recalled that he carried his Greek grammar with him wherever he went. College students frequently joined secret societies. These are kind of the forerunners of the, of the Greek societies today, only they were really Greek societies, uh, that assigned them pseudonyms taken from ancient history. While they were students and frequently afterward, the founders kept commonplace books. These were notebooks in which they copied the literary passages that most interested them. These were often Greek and Latin passages. And we, we learn a tremendous amount. These are very valuable to historians to know what Jefferson or Madison, when they were a teenager, what they thought was most uh, interesting to copy. And it's, it's a very valuable insight into their minds. Commencement exercises generally featured ex exhibitions in which students competed for prizes by reading Greek and Latin or by speaking Latin extemporaneously. The founders made certain that their own children were as thoroughly steeped in the works of the ancient historians as they themselves had been, believing that the classics provided an indispensable training in personal and civic virtue that society could abandon only at its own peril. So what were these stories that the founders studied? Well, there was a story of Sparta. From Thucydides and Plutarch, the founders of the United States learned the story of Sparta, which was perhaps the first totalitarian state in history. From this tale, the founders learned both the strengths and weaknesses of republics that emphasized the collective good over individual rights. In the end, the founders, like Aristotle and, and others before them, could admire the virtues of Sparta while rejecting the harsh social practices that produced them. Like other modern Republicans, the founders preferred to rest their republic on the natural rights of individuals, even while urging sacrifice for the common good. For instance, when Samuel Adams, who's been called the father of the American Revolution, you know, the leader of the Boston Sons of Liberty, when he prayed that Boston would become what he called a Christian Sparta, he was referring to Spartan frugality, selflessness, valor, and patriotism. Similarly, in his very influential letters from a Pennsylvania farmer, 
John Dickinson quoted Plutarch in praise of Spartan calm and courage in battle. Americans ought to imitate this calm firmness in resisting unconstitutional taxation, Dickinson claimed. But while the founders admired many of the traits that the Spartans' intense military training had instilled in them, few were prepared to advocate so complete a suppression of individuality. Thomas Jefferson referred to the Spartans as military monks. In Federalist No. 6, Alexander Hamilton noted, Sparta was little, little better than a well-regulated camp. John Adams called Sparta's communal ownership of goods stark mad. To the Abbe de Mably statement, how right Lycurgus was in forbidding Spartans to communicate with other Greeks, Adams retorted, is it such a felicity to be confined in a cage, den, or cave? Is this a liberty? Well, what other stories? Well, from Herodotus and Plutarch, the founders learned the story of the Persian War, the near miraculous victory of the tiny Greek republics over the seemingly invincible Persian Empire. From this tale, the founders learned that it was possible for a collection of small, small republics to defeat a centralized monarchical empire in a war for survival. This was a crucial lesson because the founders faced just such a power in the Revolutionary War. Just as few contemporary observers had expected the Greek republics to defeat the Persian Empire, which was, had never been defeated, uh, the greatest power on earth in the early 5th century BC, few observers of the founders, they expected the weak and undisciplined collection of American republics to defeat Great Britain, which was the greatest power on earth in the 18th century. But the founders accepted without reservation Herodotus' conclusion as to the source of the Greek victory over the Persians. Quote, free men fight better than slaves, end quote. After the coercive or intolerable acts were passed in 1774, John Adams expressed a common view. Quote, the Grecian commonwealths were the most heroic confederacy that ever existed. The period of their glory was from the defeat of Xerxes to the rise of Alexander. Let us not be enslaved, my dear friend, either by Xerxes or Alexander. From Thucydides and Plutarch, the founders learned the tales of the growth of democracy in Athens and Sparta's victory over Athens in the Peloponnesian War. Since neither historian was sympathetic to the democratic system of government in Athens, it is not surprising that the founders connected these two developments, blaming Athenian democracy for the disastrous defeat. In addition, they learned from Plato the story of Socrates' execution by the Athenian masses on false grounds. That was right after the Peloponnesian War. The negative view of democracy the founders derived from ancient historians and philosophers played no small part in their decision to create what they called a republic, a classical mixed government in which the masses would have a share of government power but would be counterbalanced by a powerful executive and a strong senate rather than a simple democracy. John Adams typified the common opinion of Athenian democracy when in his defense of the constitutions of government of the United States of America, he attributed Athens' downfall to it. According to Adams, the Athenians had condemned their own society to destruction by consolidating all power in the hands of the masses and failing to balance that power with a strong executive and a powerful senate. Adams wrote that simple democracies like Athens were, quote, but a transient glare of glory which passes away like a flash of lightning or like a momentary appearance of a goddess to an ancient hero, which by revealing but a glimpse of celestial beauties only excited regret that he had never seen them. But through the establishment of a mixed government and through such modern innovations as representation and the separation of powers, the United States could escape, quote, the tumultuous commotions like the raging waves of the sea, which always agitated the ecclesia at Athens. The ecclesia was the popular assembly. Adams concluded regarding the American experiment, 
quote, this will be a fair trial whether a government so popular can preserve itself. If it can, there is reason to hope for all the equality, all the liberty, and every other good fruit of Athenian democracy without any of its ingratitude, convulsions, or factions. Thus, at the Constitutional Convention, James Madison, who's often called the father of the Constitution, argued for a nine-year term for U.S. senators, declaring that their chief function was, quote, to protect the minority of the opulent against the major majority. In Madison's notes for Federalist Number 63, in which he again championed an aristocratic senate, he cited Aristotle, Polybius, and Cicero, all supporters of mixed government and opponents of democracy. Alexander Hamilton, John Adams, John Dickinson, and numerous other founders endorsed the Constitution as having established a mixed government that balanced the power of the one, the president, the sort of elected king, you might say, the few, the aristocrats, the rich, the well-born, who would be represented by this aristocratic senate, and the many, the masses, the majority, who would be represented by the House of Representatives. Remember that both the President and the Senate were indirectly elected in the beginning. The President by the Electoral College, which was not uh, you know, chosen by the people, and the Senate, which was chosen by the state legislatures until 1913. Now, it is true that by the 1790s, so very quickly, the Democratic-Republican Party, led by Jefferson and Madison, began to endorse reforms that would create a more democratic government. These reforms included an end to property qualifications for voting and the linkage of the Electoral College to the popular vote. The people began electing the electors, in other words, the presidential electors. But even then, the equal representation of small states in the Senate meant that legislation required more than simple majority support. And even the Democratic Republicans tended to use the word republic rather than democracy concerning their favorite system and tended to emphasize the crucial role of representation. Uh, no one endorsed the direct democracy of Athens where the people voted directly on legislation because it had been so brilliantly vilified by the ancient historians. What else? Well, in the works of Plutarch, Polybius, and Demosthenes, the founders encountered the story of the conquest of the Greek republics by Macedon. From this tale, most of them learned the importance of a strong central government to bind the American states together in a powerful union. Without such a union, these founders believed, there was a real danger that the United States would suffer the same fate as the Greeks who lost their liberty because of constant internal strife that left them vulnerable to foreign invaders. At the Constitutional Convention, at state ratifying conventions, and in published essays, the Federalists, as they were called, these people who wanted a stronger federal government, repeatedly cited ancient Greece as a civilization destroyed by decentralization. James Wilson, Alexander Hamilton, and James Madison all made this case at the Constitutional Convention. Hamilton noted regarding the Greeks, quote, Philip of Macedon, at length taking advantage of their disunion and insinuating himself into their councils, made himself master of their fortunes. Americans could expect to be subjected to foreign domination as well, Hamilton insisted, if they remained a weak, disunited collection of republics similar to the Greek city-states. On the next day, James Madison reiterated this point. Just as Greek disunity had allowed Philip to, quote, practice intrigues resulting in their enslavement, so American disunity would produce the same result. Citing Plutarch, Madison also contended that the constant warfare between the Greeks might be repeated among the American states unless they were bound together by a strong central government. At the New York ratifying convention, Hamilton noted regarding the incessant wars between the Greek city-states, quote, those that were attacked called in foreign aid to protect them, and the ambitious Philip, under the mask of an ally to one, invaded the liberties of each and finally subverted the whole. Thus, the lesson that the founders had learned from the Persian War during the Revolutionary War was partially reversed by a lesson they learned from the fall of Greece thereafter. <clears throat>
While the Persian War had proved that a small cluster of republics animated by patriotism and love of liberty could triumph over a large centralized monarchy, a lesson vital to the United States during the Revolutionary War, the fall of these same republics to the centralized power of Macedon also proved instructive to the founders in their quest to build a stronger union following the war. The founders learned that a certain degree of centralized power was necessary even to a confederacy of republics. So that, those are the lessons they learned from Greece, the stories of Greece. What about Rome? Well, from Polybius and Livy, the founders learned the story of the rise of the Roman Republic. The founders considered the early Roman Republic, not Athens or Sparta, the greatest ancient model for the United States. Athens was too democratic and unstable, and Sparta too collectivistic and militaristic to serve as close models for the founders. By contrast, the Roman Republic, the founders believed, had given the masses enough power to avoid a tyrannical oligarchy without giving them so much control as to establish what they called uh, an oclocracy, that is, mob rule. Furthermore, the founders believed that the early Romans had personified the virtues so vital to a republic. One of the founders' greatest heroes was Cincinnatus, the 5th century B.C. Roman, who having been granted dictatorial power for a six-month period and having defeated the enemies that threatened the city in just 15 days, immediately resigned his dictatorship and retired to the plow. George Washington not only took notice of the fact that people compared him to Cincinnati, but also worked consciously to promote the analogy. Washington recognized that his appeal lay not in military victories, of which he had very few, actually. He was not that great a, a tactician, uh, but in the Republican virtue revealed in his surrender of power. Thus, Washington never offered to resign as commander of the Continental Army, even after the worst defeats, because he did not wish to spoil by anticipation the offer of resignation that he planned once he had, like Cincinnati, defeated the enemy. Soon after that day arrived in 1783, Washington withdrew completely from public life, even going to the extreme of resigning from his local vestry. Now he's really making a point. I'm Cincinnati, so I'm, re I'm retiring completely from public life. In his letters of 1784, the following year, Washington referred to Mount Vernon as his villa, which is a Latin term that he had never before employed in allusion to his estate. Sounding like the Roman poet Horace, he referred to himself as, quote, a private citizen of America on the banks of the Potomac under my vine and my own fig tree, free from the bustle of a camp and the intrigues of a court. Proud of his position as the first president of the Society of the Cincinnati, which was an association of Revolutionary War veterans, Washington demanded reforms of that organization when popular fears of, of it threatened to destroy the image associated with its name. The period of ancient history that, the, that most enthralled the Founding Fathers was the era that witnessed the decline and fall of the Roman Republic. Since the Founders equated Rome with the Republic, the Roman Republic, they considered the real decline and fall of Rome to have occurred in the second and first centuries BC, not half a millennium later when the empire finally collapsed. The Founders' intense scrutiny of the late Roman Republic resembled an autopsy. The purpose of this autopsy was to save the life of the American body politic by uncovering the cancerous growths that had caused the demise of its greatest ideological ancestor. Their study of the writings of Plutarch, Sallust, and Cicero not only reinforced their belief in the importance of virtue to a republic, but also convinced them of the need for vigilance against ambitious individuals who might threaten the republic. Therefore, like their favorite ancient historians, the founders admired Cato the Younger and Cicero, two men who had died defending the Roman Republic, and they despised Caesar, Julius Caesar, who destroyed it. A great fan of Joseph Addison's Cato, an enormously popular play based very closely on Plutarch's 
lives of Cato and Caesar, George Washington often drew upon the play. In 1775, he pre prevented the resignation of General John Thomas, one of his generals, who was angered by an unjust emotion by paraphrasing Cato's line from the play. Surely every post ought to be deemed honorable in which a man can serve his country. Despite congressional resolutions in 1774 and 1778 that prohibited all public officials from attending plays, Washington ordered Cato performed at Valley Forge. He hoped to improve the soldiers' morale by inspiring them with the example of Cato's men who had demonstrated extreme selflessness in the struggle for liberty. During, during these difficult times, Washington often repeated another line from this play, uh, Addison's Cato, "'Tis not in mortals to command success." Perhaps it was Cato's willingness to sacrifice his proffered property on behalf of the Republic that led Washington to reproach his overseer for placating British troops with grain. Washington declared that the overseer should allow Mount Vernon to be leveled before giving any aid to the enemy. That's a very Roman statement. You can almost, uh, you can almost, uh, you can almost say this came from Livy. The statement, you know. In 1783, Washington turned to Cato when his officers, furious over Congress's perpetual inability to pay them, mutinied at Newburgh, New York. The rebels planned to threaten the states with a coup unless they yielded more power to Congress. Congress did not have the power to tax, therefore they couldn't pay the, the soldiers. Uh, it was a real mess. Although Washington considered the strengthening of the weak Congress vital to national survival, he perceived even the threat of a military coup as both dangerous and dishonorable. In his speech to the officers, he to put down his rebellion, he employed the same three tactics that Cato used to face down his mutineers in Act 3, Scene 5 of Addison's play. First, Washington rebuked the anonymous author of a circular letter that urged mutiny, just as Cato had lambasted his rebels. Second, like Cato, Washington pleaded with his officers not to tarnish the Republican honor they had won by turning against the Republic. Third, like Cato, Washington appealed to the sympathy and respect his past service had earned him. And he was very clever in that regard. He, he comes in, he, he takes his speech carefully out of his pocket and he un, uh, unfolds it and he puts on his spectacles and then he says, and they're all listening, you, know, you could hear a pin drop, and they're all listening, and he says, uh, he apologizes for putting on his spectacles, but he says, I have grown not only gray, but almost blind in the service of my country. And there was not a dry eye in the house, and after that he had him in the, in the palm of his hand. And that, well, again, very Roman sort of thing to say. Washington even paraf paraphrased lines from the play, Cato, in his own speech. Uh, and this is a, you know, this is a spe this is a especially uh, powerful coming from Washington because he was not well educated. His father died when he was 11, which blew his whole classical education that he would have had. And uh, he was not the kind of guy he didn't know uh, all of this great literature the others knew. He didn't memorize things from literary works, and yet he memorized all of this stuff from from Addison's Cato. It shows how how important it was to him. Other founders utilized Ad Addison's Cato as well. The two most famous lines of the American Revolution, in fact, Patrick Henry's Give Me Liberty or Give Me Death, and Nathan Hale's I Regret That I Have But One Life to Give for My Country, were actually paraphrases of lines from that play. While Washington derived the sense of identity and purpose from his emulation of Cato, John Adams derived the same benefits from his lifelong identification with Cicero. As early as 1758, Adams gloried in the fact that law, his chosen profession, was, quote, a field in which Demosthenes, Cicero, and others of immortal fame have exalted before me. In 1774, Adams urged an aspiring politician to adopt Cicero as his model. He wrote regarding Cicero's proconsulship of Lilybaeum in Sicily, quote, 
He did not receive this office as persons do nowadays, as a gift or a form, but as a public trust, and considered it as a theater in which the eyes of the world were upon him. Adams added that when Rome was short of grain, Cicero managed to feed the city without treating his own province unfairly. When Adams, who was one of the greatest orators of his day, rose before the Continental Congress on July 1, 1776, to rebut John Dickinson's contention that American independence would be premature, the New Englander thought of Cicero. He recorded in his diary, I began by saying this was the first time in my life that I had ever wished for the talents and eloquence of the ancient orators of Greece and Rome, for I was very sure that none of them ever had before him a question of more importance to his country and to the world. Adams' admiration for Cicero outlived the American Revolution. In fact, he spent the summer of 1796, just months before assuming the presidency, rereading the Roman statements, uh, statesman's essays. In 1803, Adams quoted Cicero regarding the true public servant. Such a man will devote himself entirely to the republic, nor will he covet power or riches. He will adhere closely to justice and equity, that provided he can preserve these virtues, although he may give offense and create enemies by them, he will set death itself at defiance rather than abandon his principles. No one followed this ethic better than Adams. In the 1760s, he refused the, the lucrative and prestigious position of admiralty court judge because he considered these juryless British courts unconstitutional. And he came from a rather middle class, I would even say lower middle class background. I mean, that would have been a great coup to, to have one of these judicial positions, but he thought they were unconstitutional and he refused. In 1770, and this is a little bit more famous, he sacrificed his popularity to defend the British soldiers accused of murder in the Boston Massacre, so-called Boston Massacre. As president in 1799 and 1800, he made peace with Napoleonic France which ironically left Thomas Jefferson, his rival, the glory of the Louisiana Purchase three years later at the expense of his own reelection. It split his, and, and Adams knew it would split his own party to make peace with France because Hamilton was opposed to it, but he did so anyway. He lost the election to Jefferson. Jefferson then is able to make, uh, is able to buy Louisiana from Napoleon. It would not have happened without Adams. It goes down as Jefferson's achievement but it was only possible because his rival, the guy he beat in the election of 1800, uh, did the right thing. While no other founder yearned so much for popularity, none so continually sacrificed it to a strict code of ethics. It is not fanciful to suppose that when making such painful decisions, Adams found consolation in contemplating the Roman statesman's sacrifices and the eternal glory they had earned him. Now, the flip side of the founders' reverence for Cato and Cicero was their distaste for Caesar, whose corruption of the Roman Republic had resulted in the rise of the emperors. In a famous part of Patrick Henry's Stamp Act speech of 1765, Henry even compared King George III with Caesar, declaring, Caesar had his Brutus, Charles I his Cromwell, and George III cries of treason may profit by their example. There's a clever save there. Uh, made his point, but didn't get his head cut off. So clever. Uh, Christopher Gadsden and Josiah Quincy summed up patriot sentiment when both claimed that Great Britain was to America what Caesar was to Rome, a corrupting influence. Both John Adams and Thomas Jefferson compared Alexander Hamilton with Caesar. Adams wrote, when Burr shot Hamilton, it was not Brutus killing Caesar in the Senate House, but it was killing him before he passed the Rubicon. In 1811, Jefferson told the story that at a party Jefferson had hosted while Secretary of State in 1791, Hamilton had inquired into the identity of the three men portrayed in Jefferson's wall paintings. When Jefferson replied that they were, quote, the three greatest men the world had ever produced, Isaac Newton, Francis Bacon, and John Locke, there had been a pause. 
Hamilton had then declared that, quote, the greatest man that ever lived was Julius Caesar. Jefferson considered the story highly significant. He's, he's telling this story 20 years later. While Jefferson, a true Republican, modeled himself after men of learning, Hamilton, a secret monarchist, modeled himself after a military figure who had done more than anyone else to corrupt and overturn the illustrious Roman Republic. The problem is it doesn't wash. Uh, the evidence indicates that either Jefferson misunderstood Hamilton or Hamilton was playing a joke on the humorless Virginian, and Jefferson was humorless. Because all of Hamilton's reference to Caesar in his own correspondence were negative, with the sole exception of one neutral reference to his military skill. Uh, you know, Jefferson, as I said, had no sense of humor. And in fact, that's why he was chosen to write the Declaration of Independence. He was on this committee with Ben Franklin and a few other people, and he was not as well known as Franklin. And so the obvious thing would have, had, would have been to have Franklin write it. Uh, but they were worried that if Franklin wrote it, he would insert a joke in there. He wouldn't be able to resist himself. And they knew that Jefferson had no sense of humor whatsoever, and there was, uh, they were safe with, with uh, Jefferson. So uh, my guess is Hamilton was playing a joke on him. But this, and, and this story is only told by Jefferson. Nobody else tells this story. It's 20 years later, and he's trying to insinuate something about Hamilton. Indeed, although Hamilton was well aware that detractors like Jefferson compared him to Caesar, he considered his opponents more deserving of the infamous name. In 1792, Hamilton called the Democratic Republicans, that's the opposite party, the, quote, Caesars of the community, a description of men to be found in every republic who, leading the dance to the tune of liberty without law, endeavor to intoxicate the people with delicious but poisonous drafts to render them the easier victims of their rapacious ambition. Hamilton left no doubt regarding the particular Democratic Republicans to whom he referred. In the same essay, he concluded regarding Jefferson, quote, but there is always a first time when characters studious of artful disguises are unveiled, when the visor of Stoicism is plucked from the brow of the Epicurean, when the plain garb of Quaker simplicity is stripped from the concealed voluptuary, when Caesar coyly refusing the preferred diadem is seen to be Caesar rejecting the trappings but tenaciously grasping the substance of imperial domination. Three days earlier, Hamilton had declared, in a word, if we have an embryo Caesar in the United States, tis Burr. That was uh, Aaron Burr, uh, all, another leader of the Democratic Republicans. The Founding Fathers, uh, this is the last story, Founding Fathers learned the story of the Roman emperors from Tacitus, Annals of Rome, and Suetonius, Lives of the Twelve Caesars. From these historians' accounts of the worst emperors, Tiberius, Caligula, and Nero, they learned the precariousness of liberty. Tyranny was the worst, and the preciousness of liberty as well. Tyranny was the worst fate, not merely because it deprived one of liberty, but also because it deprived one of virtue. The corrupting effects of living in tyranny, the dehumanizing sycophancy, and the degrading collaboration necessary to remain in the tyrant's good graces were more abhorrent and disgusting than the oppression itself. During the Revolutionary period, the founders compared the British Parliament and the Tories with the Roman emperors and their minions. Samuel Adams compared a certain Tory with the multitudes of, uh, of informers whom Caligula and Nero had employed. Adams added, quote, the Stamp Act was like the sword that Nero wished for to have decollated the Roman Empire at a stroke. It was actually Caligula who said that. He wished he could cut off the Roman people's heads with just one stroke. In 1767, John Adams rather improbably compared the dull royal governor of Massachusetts, Francis Bernard, with Nero, Caligula, Attila the Hun, and Caesar. Adams compared the Tory slander of William Pitt the Elder and Benjamin Franklin with Nero's murder of Seneca. These improbable analogies were not mere rhetorical flourishes. They represented the genuine fear of tyranny inherent in nearly all classical texts. 
Tyranny was an inexorable cancer that must be destroyed in its early stages. Unconstitutional taxes, however small, violated sacred principles of liberty as surely as mass executions. Indeed, if unchecked, the former would likely eventuate in the latter. The slippery slope was a quintessentially classical idea. Perhaps more than any argument, this fear had produced the desire for independence from Great Britain. If the cunning prime ministers of Britain could ever convince the American public to accept even the smallest unconstitutional tax, Americans would eventually lose not only the power, but also the very will to resist. Americans would then be no more than slaves, subject to the whims of distant masters. To stay within the British Empire would be to witness the recreation of that horrifying degradation and depravity that Tacitus and Suetonius had so vividly described in Rome. But to leave the empire and start anew would be to embrace the exciting possibility of creating a society so elevated and virtuous as to inspire future Plutarchs to immortalize the nation. The fear of witnessing another Roman empire was as essential to producing the revolution as the hope of creating another Roman Republic. As Jefferson astutely noted in the Declaration of Independence, humans are not, by nature, rebels. Only genuine fear of the dire consequences of persisting in their current situation, coupled with real hope in the possibility of, of achieving a better fate, can inspire people to disrupt their lives and undertake the arduous sacrifices and hazard the frightful dangers characteristic of revolutions. The conflicts of the revolutionary and constitutional periods increased the founders' sense of kinship with the ancients. Imagine the founders' excitement at the opportunity to match their ancient heroes' struggles against tyranny and their sage construction of durable republics to rival the noble deeds that had filled their youth. The founders were thrilled by the belief that they were beginning anew the work of the ancient republicans, only this time with an unprecedented chance of success. While the valiant Roman republicans had ultimately lost the first round of combat against tyranny, the founders, starting, in a, starting afresh in a virgin country with limitless resources, could pack the punch necessary to win the second and decisive round. Just as the Founding Fathers learned valuable lessons from ancient stories about their Greek and Roman heroes, Americans have traditionally learned important lessons about courage and self-sacrifice from their own tales concerning the Founders. As long as human society exists, there will be a need for stories. The only question is whether the stories provided will be rich enough and inspirational enough to serve societal needs. Perhaps it is now time for the American public not only to return to the founders, to explore the totality of their lives, its tragic as well as its heroic elements, but also to return to the great fountainhead of knowledge at which the founders filled their own buckets. Perhaps it is time to learn whatever lessons the ancients can teach the 21st century. If you have any questions, please use the microphone. Thank you. The two people on the... Hi. Um, it's not so much a question as just um, if you could elaborate maybe a little bit on um, the building elements that um, our founding fathers and people incorporated, you know, pediments and columns. And I right. find that really fascinating that have those reminders everywhere in our civic buildings. And Jefferson, of course, was a great leader in that neoclassical movement. Uh, you know, in addition to all of his other talents, he was an architect. Uh, and he uh, designed the uh, state capitol at Richmond in the 1780s, um, the University, later uh, Monticello, of course, University of Virginia later on, but also had some input in the U.S. Capitol. And he was, uh, he was especially fond of Roman models uh, because Roman models uh, combined the, the Greek column with the dome shape, and he loved that, that combination. 
and we see it in just about all of his his structures. Uh, so yeah, I mean, and and it, so he was a. Uh, uh, not the only one, but he was certainly a major influence in the spread of neoclassical architecture. And by the time the antebellum period comes along, there's hardly, uh, it's not just state capitals, there's hardly uh, a county seat that didn't have a neoclassical building as its centerpiece. And they vied with one another to, to, to uh, outshine each other in, in that area. What I find interesting about Jefferson's uh, uh, writings about neoclassical architecture, that I was expecting to find him making these grandiose statements about what it means. You know, it's, I expected him to say, well, it, it's so symmetrical, so it represents reason, or it represents republicanism. I thought at least he would, would say that. No, what he says is, and I found this fascinating, what he says is, no, we have to do this in order to win the, uh, the approval of, of the world. That this is something that will, will give us uh, in our government a dignity. It's respected. It's lasted for thousands of years. He said it, it has achieved the approbation of millennia. And, and, and it was, what I find fascinating about this is that it shows these men had a longing, even as they were overturning European forms uh, of government, and claiming that we're we're better, you know, than Europe, they're also trying to win that approval of Europe. Just as the Puritans, the Puritans left England, but they were still trying to get England to follow them, and and to to win the respect of England. The founders are still trying to do that, and I think some of that has to do with their background. Uh, someone did a study which I found very interesting, where they said almost none of the founders had. Uh, uh, Almost all of them were the first person in their family to go to college. Almost all of them. Those that did go to college. Some didn't, you know, like Ben Franklin didn't have much of a formal education. But those that did go to college, almost all of them were the first in their family. These were not the top elite of colonial society. The top elite favored the king. They were the Tories. And the, so these are, these are uh, they're an elite, but they're a lower elite, and they feel like they're being locked out by birth and by wealth from the positions that they uh, deserve by virtue and education and talent and so on. And so they want to establish a meritocracy. And I, I think they see um, America is in the same position toward Europe as they are toward the top elite. That we're upstarts, and we want to show Europe that uh, we're not a bunch of hicks here. You know that we have education and we have learning and we have virtue, and this classical architecture represents that. You know, and so the, we, America stands in rel relation to Europe the way the founders, that lower elite stood, with the upper elite. Hi. Um, I think that qu my question is going to kind of piggyback off that a little. Um, I was just wondering, we know that English were also reading all of these Greek and Roman writers, and how were they interpreting their toward, toward the Revolutionary War? What was the interpretation? That's a very good question. I mean, you have the same, um, uh, same classical system of education in England, and yet they're interpreting things very differently, obviously. And not only that, but you have American Tories, we're also interpreting the, uh, interpreting the classics very differently, much the way the English were. And so they would look, they looked at different things. For instance, they would look at, say, uh, positive things that were written about Augustus, you know, this Roman emperor who, who did all of this, uh, had all these achievements to uh, Roman civilization and so on. And uh, so, uh, and that's the thing about the classics is that they're so varied and rich that you can interpret them different ways and, and draw different things uh, from them. So certainly, I mean, their interpretation was not a, a pro-Republican one. It was more of a literary, uh, a thing of literary excellence, artistic excellence, rather than political excellence. But to the extent that they looked for political models, it would be in Augustan Rome, which had a, which had a powerful but benevolent uh, emperor. Uh, but and and then of course they look at uh, not only they look at Augustus but they say look at all the uh, you know Virgil, Horace, Ovid. When did they write? They wrote during the period of Augustus. So that that monarchy, a benevolent, enlightened monarchy, can lead to a flourishing of the arts. That's how they would look at. It. 
would you go to, as far as to say that uh, liberal education is um, allows that expanded view that perhaps we reach a point where education loses that concept and then the expanded view disappears and we end up with something else entirely differently. Sure, I mean, I, I think, think there's, a, there's a lot to the classical ed system of education. I, I think, you know, these are classics for a reason. It's, it's sort of a natural selection that takes place. Uh, I'm convinced there was a lot of junk that was produced in Athens and Rome, but it didn't make it, it didn't make the cut. It wasn't copied because these things were difficult to copy and time consuming and expensive and laborious, and who's gonna, who's gonna spend the time to copy a bunch of junk? Now some people did, but not enough of them. <laughs> See, this is natural selection. Those manuscripts don't survive as much because they're not copied as much. And uh, you know, you could take that a bit too far, but I think there's a certain truth to that. And therefore, the, there's a reason why these things survived for a couple of thousand years. Yes, they have their biases. I mean, these were aristocratic men, by and large, who wrote these things. Uh, they have their biases, and you have to take those into account, just as you do with any literature. Uh, but once you, but but they also are, are, are excellent. They're excellent in their composition. They're excellent in their thoughtfulness. And also surprisingly, uh, at times, surprisingly balanced. I mean, you know, Tacitus is this uh, great Roman patriot and imperialist and so on, but it's Tacitus who puts into the, the mouth of the, of the uh, uh, Britain uh, chieftain, uh, they make a desert and call it peace, you know. That's Tacitus. He didn't have a transcript. You know, he made that speech up. He didn't have a transcript of the Brit British chieftain speech. I mean, and the historians did make up these speeches, but it was, uh, it was not fraud because the reader expected them to. So the reader went in knowing that these are, these are that, that uh, at best he will have gotten their argument. You know, he, someone reported to him what they said in general, and, but he put it into his own form. But you find this again and again. You find uh, surprises you know, that you don't expect uh, a patriot from a certain society to, to present a certain view, and yet they do. You don't, you don't expect an aristocrat to have sympathy for the poor, and yet you, you, you find that. And so uh, even those biases are not as great as, as I think they're sometimes portrayed to be. But certainly the excellence of their composition, the literary excellence, and the thoughtfulness uh, you know, if you spend your, your years studying this, I think some of that will rub off on you, you know. The, uh, yeah. Where does somebody like uh, Bobby Kennedy or the Kennedys, uh, the way that they viewed it and, you know, they talked about it, their, their readings, etc. cetera, um, how do you view them and what about the impact of them during that time and then what's happening now with people and let's say in the next few years what's going to happen on the effect of you know the things that bobby said and on well it's not really my field i mean do you have something more specific bob kennedy quoted a number of things, and he read a number of things, and right. Right. seemed to say that he was right. uh, educated in these things, and right, right or wrong. Um, and what's happening... That shows how far into the 20th century it went. It, yeah. it did go, yeah. and where is it going now, I guess, is my oh, okay. question. Yeah, good question. Uh, and not only... I mean, you, Truman knew Roman history very, very well. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, people talk about when did the classics decline? It's a big issue, and why did it decline? I think there's a certain declension after the Civil War because that whole society was basically destroyed and almost starting anew. And the concerns they had were economic, and classics don't deal much with economics. Uh, there was an uh, interest in science as well, and of course, the, even though the ancients uh, began science as we know it, obviously we've gotten beyond them. Uh, so the interest in the classics subside, I think, after the Civil War, and you find it at Harvard, at Yale, and the major colleges by the end of the century, they're no longer requiring uh, 
Greek and Latin. Now, some students are still taking it, but they're no, no longer required. But even then, is that a big declension? Uh, you still find it increasingly in the high schools. I mean, hundreds of thousands of, of kids learning Latin every year for decades. Apparently, it did go down in the, in the 60s and 70s, I believe. But it's now coming back, actually. Uh, a lot of these private academies, uh, including, interestingly enough, Christian academies, because there's always been kind of a love-hate relationship between Christianity and the classics. From the very monk, from the time of the very monks who copied the classics, even while they didn't approve of some of it. Uh, so that's interesting. But not just uh, Christian academies, other academies, uh, uh, homeschooling. You know, a lot of homeschoolers are, are, are uh, fastening onto these these educational curricula that emphasize the classics. So uh, many people think that it's that it's coming back. Um, I, I know that my mother made me take Latin, but it was entirely for my SAT score. <laughs> and I, I wonder if that's right. a little bit of what's going on. Uh, so th the question I have is quite possible that the entire premise of my question is false, in which case just say so. Well, I'm struck by the description of Washington, for example, and I've heard some other stories about Washington, about this like almost frightening self-cultivation where right. he has these plans about how he's going to appear to others, and he's always right. in the right place at the right time, saying the right thing, and it just seems like almost frightening. And then there's Adams, who seemed to really actually just try to like embody the spirit of the mm -hmm. ancients that he admired instead of saying the lines and acting the acts. And yet, nonetheless, it does seem like Washington had this like enormously encouraging effect on the people he met and was worshipped almost like a god. And Adams was like just pain in the ass for most <laughs> right. people. And I'm right. curious, is there is there something really there where it's actually the appearance matters more and and the ability to just appear, you know, in this case, right. Roman in the right way is really what inspires people, is really what changes politics? Or, you know, from your research, is it is, is there some deeper thing about embodying these virtues that has a more lasting effect? Yeah, I, that's a good question. I, I don't think it's a dichotomy. I think both men really believed in these, in these principles. Uh, and I think both men uh, also understood, I mean, all of the founders just about had this image of being on stage they really thought that the world was watching them, and not, not just the world, the, the history with a capital H, posterity, was going to make a judgment on them. And, and why did they think this way? Because they spent all their time from the time they were kids reading historians' judgments about the Greeks and the Romans. And so they, they extrapolated from that. One day they're going to be writing about us like this. We're, we're on stage, and we've got to be careful uh, how we act. And I think they both believed that. I think Washington was just a lot better at it. Uh, and I think it's because he had a natural reticence. He was not a good old boy. Uh, there was a story that I think it was Governor Morris, who was about as close to Washington as anyone, once uh, tried to demonstrate to some friends that Washington is not really that aloof. You know, he's not really that uh, uh, awkward or aloof. I uh, went and, and slapped him on the back, and Washington gave him a look that just froze him in, in his tracks. You didn't slap Washington on the back. You know, and, and it's, it's, it's his personality, but his personality, I think his natural personality was dignified and reserved largely. I mean, he could erupt sometimes in anger privately, but he would never do that publicly. But it's, it is partly cultivating an image. Uh, but... Uh, but he was very good at that, and I think it fit his personality. Whereas Adams, Adams was just un-Roman in many ways by, I mean, by his personality. He was, he was the kind of guy who did, unlike Jefferson, he did have quite a sense of humor, and he did make jokes, and he, did, he got passionately upset by things. And, and he just uh, he was not, what, you know, no matter what he did, he was not going to come across as being Roman, I think. What discourse was there, if any, to resolve differences between what was a Christian America at the time of the Founding Fathers 
and a pagan Republican Rome? That's a good question. You know, this whole relationship between Christianity and the classics, as I said, is a love-hate relationship. You go back to, uh, okay, I mean, the, the very beginning of Christianity, they were persecuted by the Romans. Uh, and then, but then Constantine becomes the first Roman emperor and the church becomes part of the establishment. And uh, you have these, uh, pagan, uh, these uh, Christian monks in the Middle Ages that are copying these that's why they survived. They copied these classical manuscripts, and uh, they didn't, uh, you know, sometimes they had real problems with what was in these manuscripts. They didn't, they didn't like the polytheism. They didn't like uh, what they would call the lewdness. You know, there was a, uh, a Christian modesty that, uh, uh, you know, the, the pagans were more lascivious, especially people like Ovid, you know. And so they, they had a real struggle with it. On the one hand, they liked the, some of the moral values that these uh, uh, so-called pagan authors were, were pushing. I mean, that they, they went along pretty well, some of them, with classical uh, virtue. And so they, and they were so well done, as I said, they were so excellently composed that these monks saw in these, these works something of value. This is a good way to teach virtue, and we can overlook some of the flaws in it. But then I think also from almost the beginning, I'm sure, there were people that said, no, they're wicked. You can't, you can't accept any of it. And this continues throughout the ages because you find even in this period, there are people saying, this should not be taught. You know, it's, it's pagan, it's polytheistic, it's lewd. Instead, they should be studying. Uh, they did study the Bible. I mean, the Greek New Testament was one of the things they read in, in grammar school. But they should be doing that more, and they should be studying about the Christian saints or whatever, something more, uh, uh, something less problematic, you might say. So that in, in every age, just about, you can find Christians condemning it, but you can also find Christians propagating it. And, and it's just that, uh, and it, that probably continues today, I'm sure. I mentioned some of these Christian academies that are teaching some of the classics, and I'm sure there are others that say you shouldn't be doing that. So uh, it's, it's just a love-hate relationship from the beginning until now, I think. No one has a question. I have one. Okay. But tell us about the conference you're going to uh, in Las Vegas in July. <laughs> Yeah, I mentioned this. I was uh, contacted by a, a libertarian economist, and I didn't even know that this existed, but there's something called Freedom Fest, which is held in all places of Vegas in every year. I don't know if it's in July every year, but it is this year. It would be pretty hot. But, uh, but this is not uh, – I think there are academics involved, but there are also hundreds, if not thousands, of uh, people, mostly libertarian, I, I gather, uh, who gather for this, and the and the uh, theme this year, the the reason why he contacted me, the theme is, are we Rome? And this whole question of, uh, you know, is the United States like the late Roman Empire and all of this? And, uh, and so he, he asked me to talk about Rome and the Founding Fathers, but there's also going to be a panel with different uh, people debating, are we, are we the Roman Empire, are we not the Roman Empire? Uh, and of course, they, it's, 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 I, th I think these, those sorts of debates, uh, in a way, they're silly, obviously, because clearly we're not literally the, the Roman Empire. But they can also be enlightening because we can look at s some similarities, but also differences. So, but, And I've never been to Vegas, so I thought I'd go. <laughs> On this note, thank you so much. Sure. Appreciate it.